I think about what we considered at the beginning of our parable and all that the householder provided before the husbandman ever, that this, that this thing was ever leased out to the husbandman. He took care of everything, didn't he? And uh, think about the great mercy of God in this and the way that the Lord has made provision. You're not going to have to go and grow anything, you know, for your sustenance. I'm just going to rain it down from heaven, right? You didn't have to do anything to earn it. You didn't have to anything, do anything to make it happen. God said, I'm just going to rain it down. But you know what? With that, there's still going to be responsibility. You're going to have to gather it. And you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not just going to have to gather it. You're going to have to gather it in the way that I command you to gather it, right? Uh, you're gonna, on, on that sixth day, you're going to have to take some extra because you're not going to gather it on the Sabbath. There's going to be rules. There are going to be commandments associated with this. So we see the great mercy and the mighty work and the power of God, but still it's not without responsibility. He says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out, shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. The margin reads the portion of a day in his day. God, it was, God had commandments concerning this. He had rules concerning this. Gather a certain rate every day that I may what? Prove them. prove them. That I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no, or not. So God gives commandment and then he steps back to test and see what are they going to do. Not as if he doesn't know, but you know what it's going to reveal? It's going to reveal to us what kind of servants we are. So when God steps back, when God manifests himself as a God that is far off, he's revealing the responsibility that he's given to man. When he goes into a far country, these are our opportunities to show what kind of servants we are. To show the kind of servants that we are. Look in the book of James. When God veils His nearness. In other words, when God doesn't seem to be a God that's near, but He only seems to be a God that's far off, do we have responsibility in that? Absolutely. What does James say in James 4 and verse number 8? So there is an awareness here in James 4 and verse number 8 that God is far off. I, I don't feel God's nearness. I don't, I don't feel near to God. James says, then you have responsibility, O man. Listen to what he says in James 4 and verse number 8. Draw nigh or near to God. God feel far off to you? You need to draw near to God. And then what does God say that He will do to you? And He will draw nigh to you. When God manifests Himself as far off, we have responsibility. Man has a responsibility to draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. When he veils his nearness, we have responsibility. He steps back to reveal what we are. When the presence of God is felt, guess what happens among a people? When the presence of God is felt among them, the people are moral. Morality rules the day. Because, I mean, they saw the mountain quake, right? The children of Israel saw Mount Sinai shake. And you know what? Nobody's going to do anything when it seems that God is so near, right? The fear of God, whenever uh, things were happening in the book of Acts, early in the church, and you remember when Ananias and Sapphira are killed. One of the effects, let's see if we can go, let's see if we can find that verse. Hold your place in James. Let's see if I can, I can actually track it down before you get over there. Uh, Acts chapter number... Five. L listen to this. So after Ananias and Sapphira are killed in Acts chapter 5, and I thought about this when these individuals you know, stole from the church. What did, what, was the, what did Peter say to Ananias and Sapphira? You haven't lied to us. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. That highlights the greatness of the offense. And, and listen to verse number 11, though. And great fear came upon all the church, and not just the church only, right? And upon as many as heard these things. And it said that there was such a fear 
of God as a result of these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And verse number 13 says, And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. What is this talking about? Verse 13, And of the rest durst no man join himself to them. In other words, there wasn't anybody that was going to get in on, on this thing superficially, right? I'm not just going to, I'm not playing around with this thing because God is in this work. That's clear. This is a serious thing. They exceedingly feared when they saw that mountain quake and, and, and shake. And when they, they understood that if anything, even a beast touched the mountain, it would be pierced through. And here they understood that this isn't just a work of man. This is a work of God. And so no man durst join himself, but we see individuals joining in verse number 14 because the Lord was adding to it, right? So there was a purity here. There was a, there, there was a shaking up as the power of God was revealed and there was a fear that fell upon them. And so morality is the result of that. When the presence of God is fit, felt, the people are moral. But what happens when the cat's away? Mice are going to play, right? And so when God steps back and His presence doesn't seem to be near anymore, when He veils that nearness and He seems to be a God that is far off, then men by their works will reveal who they are. In the book of James, I told you to hold your place. James chapter 2, you do understand this morning that our works will either condemn us or justify us. Justification is a work of God alone. We are justified only because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. There is nothing, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. There's nothing that I can do to make me just before God. But what is he talking about in the book of James right here then? In James chapter 2 and in verse number, let's see, uh, look at, listen to verse number 21. Well, verse number 20. It's hard to decide where to start here in this passage. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father, what's the word? justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Now, Paul is very clear when you read the Romans letter that, we are, that, that it is only the faith that God has granted whereby we are saved, that there's not any work that we can add to that. But what is James stressing here? James is stressing the other end of that thing. He said, if you really have faith, your works without a doubt will follow. Every one of God's true children are fruit-producing trees. Amen. We saw that with the fig tree that had no fruit on it. In fact, that's earlier in our chapter in Matthew 21. Everyone, Jesus said, it is the will of my Father that you produce fruit, that you bear much fruit. And He says in, in John 15, I think verse number 16, and that your fruit shall remain. It's lasting fruit. We looked at the man, the blessed man in Psalm 1, and it says, He brings forth His fruit in His season. All of God's children are fruit producing trees. And so Abraham was just a, the way that you can look at Abraham and say, That is a man that is justified. The way that God is going to judge the whole world is by the works that manifest the faith of God within the heart. So seest thou how faith wrought with His works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. If you say, I have faith, and you have no works that follow up that faith, then it's not really faith at all. So God removes his felt presence, and men by their works they reveal what they are by our works, we will either be condemned or we will be justified before God. So in verse number 34 in our text, what happens? In the, verse 34, listen to what it says at the beginning of the verse. He goes into a far country. God, God veils His nearness, His felt presence. They're tested. 
Let's see what they will do. And when the time of the fruit drew near. We see in verse 34 that it is the time of fruit. In other words, it's reasonable for him to expect it. I should have read this when we were looking at the fig tree some Lord's days back because this shows that when he came to that fig tree, it was the time to expect fruit. It's reasonable for him to expect it. We've already considered with the husbandman all that the landowner had done, right? In the building of the tower and in the wine press and in and putting the hedge about it. All that he had provided. And so with all that the landowner had done, it was reasonable that he should expect fruit in this season. Uh, we won't turn there for time's sake, but we, we were familiar with Isaiah 5. I think we read it when we looked at the fig tree. In Isaiah 5, 4, where he talks about what more could I have done for my vineyard, right? right. It should have brought forth good grapes, right? But when I looked, there were wild grapes instead. What more could I have done? What more could the landowner have done? How much mercy could he have shown? Who will stand before God and say, God, I didn't get a fair shake? Nobody. Listen, we live in a society where everything under the sun is an excuse, right? Well, I did that because of somebody else did that. You know, I'm going to blame my mom or my daddy, or I'm going to blame my children or my wife or my husband, or everybody else is to blame except me, right? We live in a society where everybody puts the blame somewhere else. But let me tell you something when you stand before God and those fiery eyes, Remember when he sees Jesus in Revelation, those eyes of fire? When those fiery eyes peer into your soul, nobody is going to say, it was because, no. Everyone will know in that hour, it was because of me. I did this. I did it on my own. I knew better. Right? There's a couple of phrases that jump out in my mind in Romans, uh, at the beginning of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 1. Uh, concerning that thought. Nobody will stand before God and honestly say, I didn't get a fair shake. Whenever the wrath of the Lamb is revealed in Revelation, no one's saying, well, I'm going to call my lawyer because this ain't right. They're, they're calling for the rocks and the hills to fall on them. Why? Because they know they're guilty. You're either going to confess that you're guilty right now, right? You're either going to repent and confess right now and find forgiveness or one day you're going to confess. You're going to recognize that you're guilty sooner or later. I would suggest doing it now while there's hope. Amen? So uh, uh, here in Romans 1, just a couple of key phrases. In Romans 1 and in verse number 20, For the invisible things of Him for, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, last two words, without excuse. No one stands before God and says, I didn't get a fair shake. God says, I've done so much. Every single one of you, every member of my creation is rendered without excuse. Similar word in chapter 2 and verse number 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable. There it is again. O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. Why? Because every time you judge, guess what you do? You condemn yourself because you're guilty. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Man is without excuse. Man is inexcusable. But listen to how the verses that follow what we just read highlight the tremendous mercy of the landowner who represents God in this case. The tremendous mercy. God, you are a God that delights in what? Mercy. And listen to the mercy of God that is revealed over and over and over again in our text. In, in, in verse number, as we continue on, verse, verse 34, When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. These are, the, these are the prophets that he sent to them, declaring the word of God, telling them what God, like Micah said, What doeth, does the Lord require of thee, O man? 
telling them plainly what God requires. And it says that they, they kill, they, they beat one and they killed another and stoned another. It, God should have cut it off right there, right? But that's not the kind of God that we serve, is it? We serve a God of great mercy. And that is revealed. Listen to the, the, the word. In ver, the, what's the first word in verse 36? Again. Again, really? They, they've already beat one and then they've killed another and they've stoned another. And yet again, it says, He sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. Again and again, He sends servant after servant. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 7. Jeremiah chapter number 7. Oh, the great mercy of God again and again, God says. How many times we ask this question with the fig tree that had no fruit? How many times does the apostate hear the gospel? How many times has that individual heard the truth? And so he sends his servants and they kill all these and they beat this one. And then he sends more than the first. He says again he sends more servants to them. Jeremiah 7 and verse number 25. Two phrases that, that, that jump out at us here. He says, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt. And by the way, that's been a long time ago by the time we get to this in Jeremiah. Since the day that your fathers came out of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, how often? Daily. Daily. God says again and again and again they've been witness unto you. And the Lord says, you know what? I haven't been lax concerning this. Not only have I done it daily. What's the next phrase? The next three words? Rising up early. I've done, I've done far above and beyond what I ought to, God says, daily. And rising up early and sending them. You know what? I looked up this, this phrase, um, uh, rising up early. This idea of God rising up early and either speaking to them himself or sending his prophets to speak to them. Eleven times in the book of Jeremiah, God says that. Eleven times. Why? Because God says you are without excuse. What's about to happen to you, you guys, you boys are going into activity and I want you to fully be aware of the fact that you brought this upon yourself. Right. What more could I have done for my venue? What more could the landowner have done for these servants? He should have wiped them out after the first group uh, uh, of servants that he sent. But the husbandmen, we see how they treated them and it says again he sent servants. Again, he said more, more than the first. God is more mercy. His, his mercy is revealed to a greater degree. They were without excuse, weren't they? God was merciful. And, we're, and where we're going to have to finish up today is that in verse number 37, we see the greatest mercy of all. He sends the first group of servants. They beat some. They kill some. Stone some. He's merciful again, rising up early daily, sending other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, He sent unto them who? His Son. Saying, they will reverence My Son. I want you to see how Mark identifies this Son in, in this same parable. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, and in verse number 6, Listen to how it reads here, verse number 2. And at the season he sent to the husband a servant that he might receive from the husbandman uh, of the fruit of the vineyard. Here it's presented that he sends one, and they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed. And many others beating some and killing some again and again and again. Having yet therefore one son. One son, he said. His well-beloved. Listen. There's never been anybody that He sent like this one right here. Never a man spake like this man. 
man, even the wind and the waves obey this man. Never been a man like this man. This one is distinct from all the ones that he sent before. Distinct from all the others. Never been a one. He had one son, his well-beloved, and he said, surely they will reverence him. Surely they will reverence, they will reverence my son, it says in verse number 6. And let me tell you something, you will reverence the son. I can promise you that every knee will bow. That every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It will be done. It will be done. This is the final act of mercy. Don't look for anyone else. There isn't anybody else. This is it, right? Last of all, He would magnify His mercy most of all by sending His one Son, His well-beloved. And what is going to condemn the world? This is the condemnation. What? That light is coming to the world and men loved darkness. This is why man will be condemned right here. There is no other. They died under Moses with two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment shall they be counted worthy of that trample underfoot the Son of God. No other sacrifice. No other. The great mercy of the cross. The cross is the pinnacle. It's the climax. It highlights, magnifies God's great mercy. There is no other way. Y'all, we're going to see this more fully as we dive further into this, but if this is just old dead history, if this is just history about what happened to the Jews, we are missing the point. There is practical day right now application for us because God has sent His well-beloved. God has sent His one Son. What are you going to do with Him? Amen. Amen.